So um, I, I love this quote. It is uh, attributed to Pablo Picasso, also Igor Stravinsky, Tennyson, and a few other people. If you if you tr look at the uh, at the der uh, the uh, derivation of it, but uh, you know, lesser artists borrow great artists steal. So folks, uh, enjoy yourselves. Steal all you want to tonight. And we'll do it as a panel discussion. Now, I'm hoping that the Zoom gods will shine and smile on us very, very favorably tonight, because this is going to be technically a bit of an ambitious kind of, a, of an enterprise. So we'll see if, uh, if I can make all the video work and get, um, get all the pictures up at the same time. OK, so Don, um, here's your first slide. So Don, um, just let's, um, let's look at some of your slides as we go through them. and. Uh, you know, I just want to sort of establish a little bit of a background. So uh, I know you've done an awful lot of woodworking over the years, uh, but, you know, do you have formal training in design? How do you do all this? No, really, I took a design class years and years ago with Keith uh, Compton's. And other than that, I studied uh, landscape painting and, and um, uh, decorative art with Carol Sue Roberts for, for several years in her, in her own studio. And I learned a lot about... Uh, balance and proportion and stuff when I had my wooden boat business. Um, so there's you no know, boat, there's no straight lines. So there's a lot of information learned there. But other than that, that's, that's it. The rest I just learned over the years. So the curves of boats really set you up well for doing turning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I say, there's, no, there's nothing straight in a boat except maybe the transom, but even that sometimes is a curve. So. It's a, it's a good learning, a good learning place. And I did it for a long time, so there's a lot stored away. So then tell us about the pictures you have up on the screen. Why these? Those are some of the places I get, I, I get ideas from. Uh, the, um, they come out of that American Craft magazine. Um, it mainly deals with glass and pottery and fabric and stuff. Not too much wood, but you can get a lot of good ideas in there. I study glass a lot because glass is, is very fluid, so there's always a lot of curves. And sometimes you want to duplicate a piece, you'll learn a lot because you figure out how to make like that piece on the top and the left to make that tail there be, be kind of a challenge. And so that's where I get a lot of my ideas there and other things. It's the Zoom on, but you got on Facebook, you get a lot of stuff around uh, Facebook. Um, so you're looking on YouTube, you get a lot of ideas in there. But I never look at wood artists. I look at mainly only, only at glass and ceramic people. That's no, I'm hearing there. ceramic you know, and glass coming up a lot in these discussions. Yeah, I use that a lot. Yeah. And where, where, where would you see glass or ceramic? I mean, are there good sources besides the magazine? Well, uh, hey, the best serve is the department store. You go into the department store, there's a lot of glass that come out in there. Or museums. Um, I go to the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, Massachusetts a lot of times. And um, if you watch, uh, they have a show, it's, it, it has, they have different kinds of exhibits. If you go up there, there's a glass exhibit up there. It's uh, very, very interesting. The stuff is right there. You know, so you can read, read it. And you can take pictures if you want. They don't, they don't mind you taking pictures. So it's, that's a good spot. You know? you know, the museums are good. Well, so let's talk about your process. And Alan, let's go to the next slide. So how do you, what are you doing here? Tell us about these. All right. The one on the left there is a cone. And I don't know if it's another drawing, but there was a lot of drawing involved in that because you had to make the cone. And that's a ring with a ball in the middle that revolves. So you had to make the cone as such that uh, you can get the motor in there in the battery pack and close it all, all up. So when you look at the bottom, you, you don't see nothing except maybe a switch. So it wasn't very big, so you had to get, you know, so I had to make a lot of drawings to make sure it sort of fit in there, you know. And the one on the right is just something that I just sort of um, drew uh, pieces of other things. And so that's kind of on the, on the front page now. I'm going to start working on that because the stem part I made once before with that big curve. I, I took a class in Keith Compton's. And the rest is just the middle is like teapot. And the balls on the end, I'm not sure what they're going to be. They could be little boxes up there or little tea kettles or whatever. But that's, that's where I start. And that, that's just free drawn. It hasn't been trued up yet with the uh, French curves or anything. So it is, and that's why it's out of balance. So that's you that. always draw before you get going? Uh, pieces like that I do, yeah. 
Yeah, and I'll draw them uh, full size on a whiteboard uh, so I can really see it because it's right across from my lead. And sometimes I'll even put dimensions on there. Um, not that they're that important, but just give me some idea where I'm going, you know? It's, it's interesting that you, you draw before you get time because with all of the um, wood turning classes I've taken over the years, I don't think the instructor has ever drawn anything and said, well, this is what we're going to do. No, I never, I, I've, uh, I've never done it. I never draw anything when I was in teaching. But, you know, you, and, you, know you, you only have to draw one side of that when you're drawing it because uh, if, you, if you just draw the left side or the right side, depending which way you can draw better. And then if you get a, a mirror, like a rear view mirror from a car, and you put it on the center line and look in there, you will see the whole image, you know, so you, you can get a good, better idea if the curves are proper. And Don, you said you you um, you use French curves. Does everybody know what those are? Okay. That's a French curve. That's a big one. And then here's a teeny one. So how do you use those? Well, um, you have to draw a line, and you take the curve and you put it on the line that you drew, and get it so it connects with most of the, most of the uh, where, where you want it. And you just draw a line, and as you move this around. You, you, doing whatever size, you can make a really perfect curve from the top all the way down to the bottom. And you only have to do half of that. You use a mirror to get the other half. I yeah, love that. then I put a mirror there. Uh, I know an old rear view mirror works nice. Just put a mirror there and you look in the mirror and you can see what the other side, what's gonna look like as a whole. It worked very well. And uh, I think they still sell this stuff. and. Uh, Somewhere, I don't know where. At one time, it was pretty common to find these things. Art stores, art, art, art stores still sell them. Art stuff still sell this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's, there it is. There's the piece right there. Is. Yeah, and there's a better, there's another drawing there. But that there, inside there, there's a, uh, a motor in the top, and there's a shaft, and there's a, and a ring, and they had to make a little bushing in there. And then below that, there's a, a battery pack that fits right in there. So Perfect. It's, only, it's only about eight inches tall and about three inches across at the bottom. So it's not very big. So let's talk a little bit more about your process as we look at the next slide. Okay. So what are we seeing here? On All right. the this is, uh, these are two uh, books that um, there was something in there about uh, learning how to uh, make, cur make forms. And these two books, uh, Mike Darlow, he has several books out. I use that. And when turning hollow forms, it's by a guy named um, Sam Seeger, I think. Uh, you, Rich, you know, you know, I gave you that guy's name. Yeah. Um, so they're they're very very helpful uh, things to look at when you're uh, when you're trying to um, design something. And that little thing there, that's a golden golden rule caliber. Yeah, there, there it is. There, yeah, looks like a big book. So explain explain what the golden rule caliper is, and maybe a couple of two cents on the golden rule. Well, you know, when you do, say you make a little hollow uh, uh, form or whatever, and you want to figure out just where the proper place where the shoulder is or the body is, you open this thing up like that, and you put the two ends for the length, and the little middle one will tell you that's where the break should be to make. Make the curve go whatever way you want it. You to go. If it's making a shoulder, or if that's part of the body, or whatever. And Don, basically, what is the golden ratio? What? How would you describe it? Yeah, right. it's kind of a portion that looks the best. You know, like two thirds, one third, two thirds, and you know, that's basically what it is. So the top is one third, and the bottom is two thirds, or it could be the other way around, depending on what you're doing. I've only just got this thing. Oh. I never, okay. I never, I never do it anything around until last year, and I was, I was saying, let me go on the computer and see if they make such a thing. And sure enough, and they're from they go from forty dollars to ten dollars. This is a ten dollar one. They all do the same job. So, yeah. There okay. also are lots of um, plans online um, where you can just make your own. Yeah. With, uh, wooden sticks and you know and some little grommets. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to um, Don. You want to say anything more about this? Or go to the next next slide. Is yeah, go good? to the next slide. Is that, that it right there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's in that book uh, of, of um, uh, hollow forms, and it shows it shows in actual dimensions how that how that uh, golden rule works with the height on the body and the height of the finial on the top. What the relation what the relationship is? There should be another one there that shows it more broken up. Yeah. 
We have another slide, so let's go to the next one then. Yeah, now, this Talk one, about this. Yeah, this is pretty good because now you can actually see you. You can draw a grid. You can draw a grid and you can divide it up. And then see this is one, two, three thirds on the bottom and two thirds on the top. Now the one on the, you know, I'm, talking, I'm looking at the picture on the left and the one on the right, it's the same thing, but it shows you the narrowness so you can get the relationship to the, the width of the top of that little cone in relation to the foot on the bottom. Top. So I, I'm curious now, how do you know when your piece is successful and how do you know when it's done? Well, um, when I look at it and it's what I designed and I, there's nothing more I can do with it. If I can't, it's done. If I can't, if it's all looks nice and smooth and it's what I wanted, then I can call it done. But, you know, you always got that chance that you think it's done, you part it off and just sit it on the bench and tomorrow morning you come in there and look at it and say, oh man, why didn't I see that bump where it down there, where it doesn't belong? Too late, <laughs> you nothing to do with that. So that happens sometimes, no matter how careful you are. But... So you've, you know, you've pulled a lot of resources yourself. I mean, um, you've learned a lot on your own, but you know, is, is design something you think is learnable? You know, if you've never had, yeah, you know, you've had I, some I think, little bit I, of training. I, but I think so. I, I think so with the um, with the uh, tools that they have out there today, especially with YouTube, this uh, computers. And there's so much out there that you just got to you just got to go for something. Don't get too complicated, and um, just go for it. I and mean, when you if you can go into a place sometimes, uh, or you look at a, a glass piece or a ceramic piece, really look at it and see how how it flows, and if you can touch it. It's even better because you can feel that how nice the curves are. You don't have a hard spot. A lot of times somebody make a, something and you'll it'll curve and then it's hard right there. It's like a bump. So but you, you you can learn it. It's nothing. It's not like rocket science. You just got to start out with easy pieces and work your way up. So go back to that and expand on that. So how do you know? I mean, you're, you're you're identifying a few of the things that you think are factors that make a piece successful. Just Tell us what, what things you look for uh, when you know you've had a successful piece. The main thing I said, the main thing I look for, does it look like the piece I designed, or all the curves where they're supposed to be, and is it balanced as far as the height and the width? Uh, that's it, that's all I, that's basically what I look for. Perfect, okay, done, this is terrific. Um, um, now we're going to go to, um, to Julianne. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll get right down to it. So for me, I don't have nearly the experience that Don or, or most of people here do, certainly not in woodworking or in wood turning. So for me, I try, as I approach the design, I try to leverage some of my other experiences. And then I spend a lot of time gathering resources and looking for designs that, you know, that appeal to me. I have a bit of a background in some design and I kind of dance around different designs. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Graphic Design. I've done some packaging work and some user interface design for, um, for online applications. Um, and then most recently, I've, I've also worked with a ceramic, um, as a ceramic apprentice with a local artist. So I've done some ceramic work and um, just as a hobby, like for the woodworking. But when I start looking, now these are not my pieces. These are um, pieces that I've gathered for inspiration. But when I start um, my approach to design, there's two things I think I really concentrate on. One is finding the shape. And um, to me, it's, it, you know, it's really such a fine line between the shape of you know, something really great and something that's you know, okay, right? Fine, but you know, finding that really nice shape is, is a challenge for me and I, and I, and I try to do that. And then, as many of you know, I like to enhance the design often with some other, you know, embellishments and such. So, so for finding the shape, there's a number of things that I do. Um, similar to what Don was saying, uh, I look for I look for other inspiration. These are some of my favorite wood turners. I think everybody probably knows knows these people and probably feel the same way. But 
Someone like David Ellsworth, he did start out as a ceramic artist. So I, I really love his shapes. Glenn Lucas, I just think the forms, his simple, like, um, like Ed was saying, or just those simple little things on his functional pieces, I just think are just beautiful and elevated. And um, Ben Fo, of course, you know, the opposite of simple, right? He's got these elaborate, gorgeous, detailed artistic designs that I, that I love. And then, you know, the remaining artists, I love their shapes. And, um, but I really also like their, their surface, surface embellishments and how they decorate things. But I encourage you to just look for people that you really admire. And then again, as Don mentioned, there's so many, there's so many resources out there. And uh, one of my favorite books is this Peter Lane ceramics book. And it's, you know, all ceramics, but the shapes are just beautiful. Um, the AAW, the online explore, the Google searches. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Pinterest, but it's, you know, a free online application that you can sign up um, for and, and organize all of your pictures and, and different makers show their stuff. It's really valuable. And then one of my favorite things to do is to go into stores and galleries and take photos and get ideas there and think of how I might be able to um, use that in my own work, again, with the shapes. And then again, as Don was mentioning, you know, look elsewhere. This, this top um, glass piece is actually a glass artist named Simon Pierce, and he does beautiful work. But there's, there's just beautiful, every, you know, open your mind, stretch, um, stretch your imagination, and, and there's just so much out there that, um, that you can find that, you can, that can inspire you, inspire your creativity. So after the finding the shape, oh, and then, and then finally, um, just kind of determine what is, um, what, what appeals to you the most? Um, for me, and this is such a personal choice, but, you know, I try to really look at something and say, you know, do I, do I like it? Do I love it? What's, you know, what appeals? Um, I like things to be lightweight and kind of upright, um, graceful. I like to touch it and feel a nice curve. And then I want it to serve its function, whatever that may be. If it's, um, if it's a candlestick, it shouldn't, you know, topple over when you put the candle in it. You know, if it's um, um, a goblet, it should feel nice to the lips and to the hands. So to think of all of that as you're picking your shape. And then um, again, in, in my quest to find something that, you know, there's, there's a good, there's the better, you know, there's the best for, for here in the top left. The, um, the vase that we see is, you know, it's fine, but the next piece to me is just a little bit more elegant, right? So it pulls it off the table um, and makes you think also a little bit about a foot, right? A foot of a piece, sometimes people consider it as an afterthought and I, and I try hard not to, you know, to think about the size, the shape, the height, you know, there's a million different things you can do with a foot. But in this case, I think that it just brings it up a bit. And then as Michael was saying about that first piece um, of his, of, of that bowl, you know, to me, this bowl here feels a little bit bottom heavy. So, um, you know, if you, if you see another bowl that, again, that curve, and you can even look at that negative space, you know, that that forms that really nice, uh, sweet, elegant curve. So I look for that. Um, down here with these little vases, they're very nice, but, Again, you know, a little bit more elegant, a little bit more graceful in the shape and in the height. And then finally, these hollow, the hollow form, um, you know, the, the second one to me is just, it has that, that nice shape to it. It has, it's just more striking as a top and a bottom piece to it. So just, you know, looking at things and, and what, um, what calls to you and then, and then trying to make a note of that and keep that as a resource for you as you move forward. So I have, um, this is one of my pieces that is really ugly. Um, we have, this is a goblet. So the top of it is a ceramic piece that I did. And the bottom is a purchased um, wooden piece before I started wood turning. Um, the top is clunky and thick and as ugly as it looks here, it looks much uglier in person. I promise you that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then, uh, I tried it with a cherry piece. So this is a diff this is the, my next version of the goblet. And this I like much better. I think that it is an improvement. It feels nice to the hand. It feels nice to the lips. It, um, you know, it, it has, you know, a nice uh, simple curve to it. 
but then always trying to, to strive for the next uh, inspiration, this last one. This is not my piece, but you know, I love this and I'll, and I'll try this, you know, I'll kind of put this aside in, in one of my, um, you know, idea books. And I think that the stem is, is beautiful and graceful and that the, the tulips, <coughs> it's just lovely. So um, always just looking to see what appeals to me and um, what might elevate my work a bit. So that's the shapes. And then um, the next piece, the enhancing of the design, Again, I try to use some of my background to, to bring some of that to, um, to wood turning in some way. I'm pretty comfortable with, you know, the carving or the painting, the masking. I love to try new techniques. Um, I love to, um, you know, get ideas from other people and try to make it my own. I look for um, inspiration in different places and, and, and ways to make it my own. So where I look most is um, really, all around me, right? So in nature, of course, for my epoxy work, I do look at flowers and the woods and dried things and shells and such as, you, as you've all seen before. But there's also, you know, tiles and architecture and, you know, fabric designs and stencils. And, you know, it's just everywhere. There's just a, a million different ways that I, that I see, you know, wow, gosh, I could really use that on the nice rim or on the outside of something. And, and then I just, try to make a note of it and, um, you know, and kind of stretch the creativity a little bit. So this is just an example of a table runner that I have. And there are these little, little stamped leaves on here. And he said, you know, I don't know. I thought that they were pretty. I thought they were really simple and pretty. So I just used them to make, um, you know, this tumbler in the plate. And I just, you know, changed it a little bit, try to make it my own, change the colors and, the design a little bit, um, but you know you can see where the inspiration came from, and and then I I did try to um, you know make it a little bit different. Now this next example, so this is a bowl of Peter Lane's, and um, beautiful, right? Lovely. Now this is a what not to do as far as I'm concerned for design. So this is um, a bowl, and some of you may have seen this one. But I really tried to, this is my first shot and I'll, I'll try it again. But in this case, to me, it looks way too close to the artists. I think it looks like I'm trying to copy and probably not really doing that great of a job um, because the, the original colors are better. The original shape is better. Um, but, and, and, I, and I don't feel like it's my own work. But again, this was a first try. So I would continue on this and um, you know, take a look and, and see what worked and what didn't and how I might make it um, a little bit more of my own. So I keep track of all my photos, all, all, the, all my, the designs that inspire me in whatever way. And I try to, um, you know, take, take really good notes. I try to keep an idea book for brainstorming and sketching. Um, there's this just a couple of pictures on the left. It's just, you know, one day I was just sitting down at the beach trying to think of things I might do when I get home and um, to New York and, and make a nice epoxy day at the beach bowl and how I might make beach balls out of polymer clay or whatever it was. I just, you know, wrote, wrote it all down. And the same with on the right, I just did a whole kind of brainstorming thing of when I get home, what are some of the things I might want to make. And, and I keep all of these notes and all these little sketches and, you know, I may refer right back to them. I might not, um, I might refer to them someday, but uh, I like to write them down or else they'll just kind of go in and out, I think. And, and when it comes time to me making something, I have, you know, lots of places to look for ideas of where to start. So this is just an example of my little idea book or one of my idea books. And you'll see it's just, you know, lots of photographs. And I'll flip through this pretty quickly in a minute. Here we go. So notes and photographs and um, you know, all different kinds of things. So, you know, whenever I have time, I could busy myself, you know, for a very, very long time with the different ideas that I have. I mean, I, I have more time than I do have ideas, but I, I do recommend that, you know, you just, you know, try to keep them organized in some way or, and stretch yourself, you know, think of different things that maybe you wouldn't do normally. Um, 
uh, try new things, don't get you know too caught up in one thing over another, and just um, just don't be afraid afraid to try new things. I, I certainly I know there's a million things I still have to learn, so I uh, just want to get started, and that's all that I have. That's fantastic. So thank you, Julianne. Um, lots to think about. Won't have to deal with it. So let's go to David and um, David Heim. For me, wood turning is all about form, about shape and proportion. My goal is to create an object that has fair, graceful curves that you want to touch. When I started turning, I looked for forms at the Metropolitan Museum. I was sketching pottery in the Islamic and Japanese and Chinese galleries. And from there, I gravitated to Art Deco uh, and to Scandinavian modern. And then I found Bob Stocksdale. Now, if you want to explore form, I think you should start with Stocksdale. For me, his pieces have a unique energy and vitality. He had an uncanny ability to read the grain and color in a piece of wood, shaping a form that really perfectly expresses those qualities. His curves go in all the right places and leave no doubt that what he created is exactly right for that piece of wood. I don't copy Scott Stocksdale's forms, but I do keep him in mind trying to make a shape that maximizes the appearance of the woods, grain, and figure. I usually start with a general notion of what I want to make, and I usually don't sketch out a shape ahead of time. If I'm doing a segmented piece, though, I'll model it in SketchUp first so that I can start with exact templates, exact measurements for all the segmented parts. I've got a small repertoire to our basic shapes that I uh, keep in mind. So as I rough out a piece, I might start to make one of those shapes, but I always try to let the wood itself guide the form. I'll adjust the shape to follow the grain or make some feature of the wood a focal point, like the apex of a curve or the center of a bowl. But in the end, I want the turning to have the grain balanced and centered and with curves that invite my touch. And if it looks a little like a Bob Stocksdale piece, well, so much the better. And then let's go to uh, Joe Larice for uh, his slides. Something a little bit different yet. So the first, um, I'm going to be talking mostly about my ideas um, and about design regarding spindle work. And a lot of this could apply to face grain and larger, larger pieces. So this first photograph, including the dust, is one of my kitchen chairs. And it's a, um, it's a decent chair. It's from Ethan Allen. And it's a manufactured, and it's very typical of what you would get from factory manufactured type uh, lathes. Um, I decided at one point I wanted to try to make um, a, a stool. And Peter Galbert had actually... Um, some directions in one of the fine woodworking and the AAW. So I'm gonna just show, switch back and forth between the two. Um, if, you, if you note here, there are some areas like in here where the, the details aren't quite as crisp, the flats aren't as maybe crisp as these areas here. Um, the bottom of the leg in the earlier picture didn't, have a, a slight curve. And I thought that that would add a little elegance to it. And um, the beads, I think, and again, the, when you're doing something like a stool or chair legs, you know, there are multiple pieces. Uh, so you have to be much more careful. You need a story stick uh, so you could get the repeat cuts. And it's pretty obvious here that, although I think overall, um, these are pretty good. The, the, the Intersections are crisp, a little sharper, um, but these beads on the bottom two are not quite as uh, round as this bead here. So in that regard, whenever you're doing any kind of multiple work, you know, you need to, you know, be a lot more careful as far as trying to, you know, uh, get them pretty close. So in, it's partly that's the reason why I, I much prefer to do um, 
items uh, that are one off, one of a kind type. And I found myself enjoying the process of wood turning probably as much as the pieces that I make. It's very meditative for me. It's very calming, relaxing. So um, I first started making tops as a practice and I would knock out tops, you know, every opportunity I had. I decided that, you know, after making about a hundred or so tops and I started getting familiar with other work of other wood artists, particularly Cindy Droza, but most, most the, the one I think I probably think is most highly of is uh, Jean-Francois Escalin when it comes to shapes, um, especially in spindle form. So right now, currently this is uh, the shape finial and this section at the top is what I would refer to as the flame part of a finial. And I'm, I'm orienting it this way because this is how you would see it on the lathe. And this flame portion um, right now is, this is probably the shape that I, I kind of like. The large part of the diameter is pretty much in the center. And when I start forming this, I, I do it on the lathe. Um, and the, the, the shape I'm trying to go for in this area is a football shape. Now, in the process of doing these, there was areas that I always found trouble. And, and the, the area that I found most trouble with is the transition point from the convex to the, to the concave in here. And it took me a long time before I developed the, the, the skills to actually do it and certainly used a lot of sandpaper. Um, but as you do it, and again, this is one of these things that I find very enjoyable. So I would, I would continue to practice. The other thing, let me just clear this, that I am now doing, and I noticed in some of my earlier work, it was nowhere near as uh, thin as this intersection between the base of that flame and what I call the saucer. And um, in this case, this saucer is straight lined and you certainly could change the shape of that too. The other element that I find very important and they're kind of subtle is this shape coming off of the full diameter of the saucer. Very often you would get a flat in here and my goal is to try to get a nice curve. So this is an influence from Jean-Francois Escalin. He, um, instead of just going from the base of, a, of that flame shape, um, he then put a bead. And I'll expand this and just talk about this bead for a while. Again, in my mind, in my eye, and again, this is something that, you know, everybody's eye is a little different, but there seems to be standards to what looks most appealing to most people. Um, in this case, this particular bead is pretty well balanced, but you'll notice that at this point, it's a little larger in diameter than here at this V portion of the cut. I generally prefer to have the bead balanced. It doesn't mean that you can't have them asymmetric, but generally I do like them balanced. And I think this would have been slightly more successful, this piece, had that line come down there. Again, when we talk about things that are kind of subtle differences in pieces, I think here I might have failed. And I'm being hypercritical, but that's good because I'm not going to improve unless I am. This is a bit of a flat for me. And when I talked earlier about this transition area in here between the convex and the concave, I think for me, turning a cove was always the most difficult. I'd always get a flat area. And you know, you would, your, your goal is to get the best possible shape you can off the tool. But certainly in an area like this, even now I will find myself um, sanding that. But the thing I use is a cone shaped um, uh, piece of wood wrapped with sandpaper. Now, if you took that flame that I talked about and you maybe shortened it a bit and maybe made the tip a little less prominent, you start to create a shape like this. Um, and this is in a way easier to turn than the other. Um, and, and again, now we're, we're, we're talking about um, a much more round shape in here and a shorter tip. And this is very pleasing in, to my eye. It's certainly not as, as elegant and as long as this, the other one. Um, but something important here, I think, is, is this angle here. And this is where there could be some difficulty as far as getting into these intersecting areas. So that's where your technique has to start to develop to 
the practical reality is if you use a 40 degree angle um, spindle gouge, you might in the process of trying to get that sharper intersection, you might have trouble doing it. And that's partly the reason why I started using the skew. The skew is a much more acute tool and I can get into tighter intersections with that. Now we, we've gone even farther. We've, we've made that flame portion much more um, round. And certainly this is, you know, something that would be really valid, right? Just get rid of the point completely. Now you have a round bead at the top. Um, but I, I do like the shape a lot, probably because if you cut it here and you tilt your head a little sideways, it looks like a candy kiss. <laughs> uh, and again, if we talk about the intersection in here, we're getting even a tighter intersection. So again, this, this was created with a skew chisel. And I think that's part of what makes um, the design of, of these um, great wood artists like Jean Francois and, and uh, the others, because they, the points from here to there are much sharper and are, are probably, you know, changing the diameter more dramatically. And I think that's important. So here's a, a, a typical finial. Um, and this was, uh, I think, a pretty successful one. But there's an area that I find you know, really lacking in this. And that is, I think that the, the flame portion at the tip here is too small relative to the rest of it. Um, if I was going to do this again, I, I would have made that larger. And again, um, I certainly sketched and, and drew out things, but now I'm at the point where I'll, 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 I'll kind of know the proportions as I move along because I really do enjoy making these. And um, <laughs> I actually you know, have to make hundreds of hollow forms or uh, ornaments to, to, to match the number of finials I have. I'm gonna just um, expand in here for a second. And when I talked earlier about the beads being um, even in terms of where their bases are, Again, this is an asymmetric bead. It's kind of a subtle difference, but if you see here, I think it's, it's clear that I made both these diameters the same. And for me, that's pleasing to me. I think maybe I could have changed this. And again, these are subtle differences. Now the cove, which also acts, if it was a hollow form, this could also be the top of a hollow form. And this area in here, could be a finger hold between your forefinger and thumb, which it very often is. And the fact that the, it's asymmetric, that the diameter here and here is different, I think is, is really makes it nice and uh, gives some visual interest. But proportionally, I think that is a problem, this particular one. Here I've changed the, uh, the actual uh, flame. It's not no longer a flame, it's a cone shape. But again, going back to the, uh, those, those uh, stool legs I made, I generally don't like flat areas. So in this case, this, this area here, there's a curve. And then this bead is a very round bead. And of course, um, I think I was successful in that both diameters on either side of the bead works. Uh, there might be a little flat in here that I find troublesome, but this overall shape I think is very nice. And again, I, I came back to that finger hold area and then another round bead to repeat the bead at the very top. So yeah, uh, listen, I, I, I think it's, a, it's important to do your own work. The point is, I think with all these elements, there's so much variety. As, as I start making a finial, I'll, I'll, I'll change these dimensions, you know, and, and then each piece is different. And that's, that's kind of interesting to see. These are three pieces that I made about, oh, I guess about eight or nine years ago. And I really, I think I want to concentrate on this front, this one, because these are the repeating shapes, similar to the last one I showed you the bead was repeating. If you look at this flame portion uh, at the top of the center finial, it's really repeated down here. Um, and I, that's nice, right? They have that repeated shape, but of course the scale is much greater. So that, that adds some interest. Um, I, I don't think I, um, I would make a base like this anymore. But the base is nice because it does, it looks like an OG curve here, which I sometimes don't do. So again, you could add so many of these different curves and, and the form is such that it's really the shape of the finials for me and, and all of these, it's about the line and the curve. 
And of course, the one on the right is just a series of beads. And that's probably more difficult to do than the other finial, at least for me. Um, I think all in all, I did a pretty balanced job on the beads. The top one, of course, there's a flat here that is pretty terrible. And my last slide. So again, this is work that I did about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, and again, I, I, you know, this just, I wanted to show the variety and how easy it is to, to change the size of the elements, the proportions of it. There's going to be ones that you just are much more attractive to your eye. Um, maybe they meet some standards, uh, the golden rule. There's probably a lot of reasons why some things, but ultimately you have to be pleased with it, I think. Um, and certainly when, we, we, when, you, when you hear what Don and Julianne and David said, you know, the, the influences that we have and where we look for inspiration is so important. Um, so here, you know, these could be minarets, they could be, uh, you know, the, you ever see the stand up of the reporter out in Moscow, right? The, the shapes of the, the beautiful buildings in the background. So, you know, you get all these inspirational ideas and then um, you, you get the opportunity to work with a lathe and have them, you know, kind of, be created right as you're working. So that's really a lot of fun. So that's it, guys. Great, Joe. Thank you. Beautiful. All right. So, um, so, so all of you, I mean, I've heard, um, I've heard a little bit about functionality and form and like, you know, what's, what's most important to you? Is it that a, it's a, the piece is functional or just that it looks good or, 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 or what? Um, who wants to start? I think it has David? to look good, whether it's a piece of wood art or something that is totally functional. Uh, if it's not an attractive piece, nobody's going to give it a second look. Nobody's going to use it. Don, what do you think? Well, my, the stuff I'm doing now, um, it, it's all in the look. It, not, none of the stuff I'm making now has any function at all. It's all stuff that you're gonna, just going to sit on the shelf and you're going to look at it. It doesn't serve any, any purpose at all. So look right now for me is the whole game. Whether it's, so it's all about the art shape or whatever. Julian, I heard I had a little bit of functionality and, and art in there. Yes. Yeah. Well, and, and I just think that, you know, those beautiful curves, whether it's going to be art piece or, or functional pieces is, is just the name of the game. I mean, looking at the, the curves and those shapes that Joe just showed, I mean, they're just amazing. They're beautiful. Whatever you use them for. And Joe, I heard functionality in the in the finials, which I wouldn't have not necessarily thought of. You were talking about, you know, the way you hold it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so often people make hollow forms and then they want to top it off with something. And so often it kind of they they go for that traditional shape. And um, you know, certainly it's uh, it could be thought of as a knob almost, right? Some grip, some handhold. So sure. So I'm, I'm sort of curious, I would like to kind of keep this whole idea of continuous improvement and, you know, design learning, you know, going with this group. How do we do that? Practice. Well, how do we do it as a group? Design challenges. Okay, that's, so I heard Julia pipe up there. That's a good Julia's idea. Wired. That's a great idea. That Julia, is a great idea. Julia, why don't you elaborate on that? I'm not sure I can add you to the spotlight, but I'll try to find That's okay. it. Um, you know, in design school, you learn about the elements and principles of design. And one of the um, first assignments, you know, that you do is you go through each one specifically and you make a, a work that just focuses on that. Um, you want me to run through them. Elements of design are line, shape, form, texture um i think there's one more help me out julian i think you probably know this right <laughs> and then um elements of no the principles of design are um balance um i think that i, I think i think that's part of like symmetry um economy of design like sim simple versus um elaborate um Okay, so I have homework to do. <laughs> but we can go through so each one of those or, or like pick one and focus on that. We'll, we'll expect the follow up for the website. So, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, by the way, um, I, I think we'll try to, uh, to, to uh, assemble some of these resources. David, I'll try to help you in terms of some of these books and all. 
And in the spirit of uh, full disclosure, since I saw the slides ahead of time, I've ordered a couple of the books already. So good luck trying to find them. So, okay. Hey, Joe, you were gonna say something, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you can get discouraged. And again, I, to, to talk about that one area that I always had difficulty with. And, and the thing is you have to be kind of critical of yourself to improve. Um, and, and you can't just, you know, say, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it now. I'll, 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 I'll come up with another design that I can do. I think you do. You have to challenge yourself. And that's exactly what I think Julia uh, is saying that there's going to be areas that you're going to maybe not, you know, um, it won't be as you know easy to do. And you do, you have to challenge yourself. And just, uh, fortunately for me, I like to practice on the lathe. So it, it's something that, you know, you do eventually get better at it with practice. This is uh, Alan. I have a thought on this, and, and so I think it's very important to be self-critical in order to improve. But you don't always have yourself the skills to really see the issues. And one of the things I've gone to uh, many of the um, woodworking conferences, um, and they'll have these um, uh, instant galleries. And at one point in the instant gallery, they will take the the professionals the experts, and they'll have a panel, and they'll um, go through some of the pieces and critique them. And they try to be kind, but they point out what they see as the issues. And I have to say, and I think this is true of just about all of us, is that we're very reluctant to point out issues with, with um, our stuff. And, you know, we show something to somebody, and nine out of 10 times, they'll, say, they'll find something good to say, right? It's a beautiful piece of wait, it's a beautiful piece of wood. So you know you, you didn't nail it with the shape or the proportions or anything. You found a nice piece of wood on the side of the road, you know. Um, but um, but I don't know that that helps us that much. I mean, it's we're kind and we're nice people, but um, I think finding some gentler way to say, you know, here's here's what could have been better, or here's something, or here's how I prefer. I don't know. What the best forum for us is, but I, I I don't think we get I don't think I get the input that would help me maybe when I make the next piece. So maybe David, go ahead. Well, I just what I said earlier is a practice. Richard Raffin has a, a practice technique for beads and coves, where you just take a long piece of wood, turn a bunch of beads scrape all that away, turn a bunch of coves, and you just keep doing that until you get to be good at beads and coves. And I, I think that same kind of practice is useful, can be useful for people who want to do face work, bowls and vessels and, and so on. Um, take a piece of wood, uh, make something, set it aside, take another piece of wood, make something else, uh, and just keep going until you develop that self-criticism, that self-critical technique that can be so important. And until you, you can train your eye to be able to see, as Joe did with his finials, these almost microscopic uh, variations. Uh, you know, a small flat area instead of a small curve. Uh, the more perceptive you can become through practice, the better your pieces will be, I believe. Good. May I add something? Yeah, go ahead. I, I, as Alan mentioned about the critique, as he said what he did, I was thinking he was saying it. And perhaps we can have a function of our, of our meetings where when we do the show and tell, um, if we want criticism, and not everyone wants criticism because they, you know, they may be sensitive or or they're a novice or whatever. But for whatever reason, everyone may have their own reason why they don't want to be critiqued. But I I appreciate and welcome the critique, and I learn from that. And maybe when we do the show and tell, we can we can if we want to be critiqued, we can remember to say everyone please don't be afraid to give me criticism because that's how I can improve. But maybe only do that if you ask for it. For those who don't want it, you won't insult them. But those who want it, say you want it. 
Yeah, I mean, we, and I'm there. I've heard a couple of good ideas for you know future meeting kinds of things, uh, potentially critiques. I think Julia's challenge idea is certainly worth pursuing. That instead yeah, of yeah. just you know some instead of just show and tell, which we could do, uh, let's issue a challenge to the membership to create something. We all create something along some theme or lines, and uh, I will tell you by experience, Julia is quite good at coming up with stuff to stump you. So. Um, uh, Julia, you're, I think you're in charge of this. Okay, I'll take it on. See that? There you go. Good. You know, this so, is Ken. I think we should consider that for our November meeting because it's two, two months away. So, terrific. Okay. Good. Good idea. Okay. Good All right. Idea. All right. So, some good ideas here. Okay. Uh, um, can I just say to Michael's point, I, I, I really think that's a great idea, Michael. My concern is the public uh, forum aspect of, of this and again you know we all we all need direction and if you could find somebody whose work uh, you really admire in that they have a good eye and then uh, you could trust them feel like you could trust them for honest criticism that's another approach too if you're if you're having difficulty you know it's always a good that's always a good idea to bounce something off of somebody and when 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 julian showed the side-by-side -side comparison that becomes re a really a, a great visual you know, when she showed that um, the, the goblets in particular, by the way, uh, Julian, I like your middle goblet <laughs> an awful lot. I think I like it more than the one that you are trying to aspire to. <laughs> the lines are very simple, I. the proportions were pristine. And, and listen, you can get carried away with these beads and coves, especially once you start getting good at making them. So try to resist that because sometimes you just get nuts. <laughs> um, but to that, I mean, if, if I, you know, I think the idea of somebody wants to be, um, you know, have the, the forum where somebody could um, say, well, geez, if you would have made that curve and accelerated it more as you came down to the bottom, that's all valid. But I, I just am concerned that somebody's feelings might get hurt in a public forum. I was, was going to say another saying. another way to do it is if you you know if you're playing around with different ideas and different shapes and and you present a couple and say which one do you think works better you know um, which design do you, do you think or which shape works I think you know that kind of feedback is really helpful too. Right. Good. Well, it might be that we can come up with a scheme where we can pair people offline for uh, for for some feedback, some mentorship kind of thing. Just something to think about a little bit. I think it would be too that one of the best wood turning tools that we all have is a pencil. Oh, absolutely. Sketching, once you so once important. you've you've roughed a blank and got it round, uh, start laying out with a pencil where you want the shapes to fall. Uh, that works on face work as well as on spindle work, and. It gives you an opportunity to look at what you've done, see if the proportions work for you before you've made a bunch of shavings and ruined a piece of wood. I, one thing I want to say that when I turn a bowl, which is primarily what I turn, um, I, like, I like to hold it in my hands and close my eyes and, and feel it that way because to me, feel... Um, I can sometimes feel things that I can't see. And uh, when I open my eyes up, I'm like, oh, there is a flat spot there. I, to me, the, the touch is, is key in design for me, for bowls particularly. So it's a trick I tried and it, it works for me. Good idea. You know, one of the things we, we, I learned in a class was they said, if you're doing a hollow form, I'm, I'm gonna do it all this, but um, before you take it off the chalk, and you put it down and go, okay, there, it's all done. The suggestion was unscrew the chuck off the lathe and then put it up on top of the headstock or on the bed and then look at it. And if you don't like it, you don't have to try to fit it back on to fix it. You just screw it back on and you keep going. And I, I never thought about doing that. I thought, you know, once you're done, you just take it out and hopefully you didn't screw it up. But just unscrewing the, the chuck off the lathe is a good way to see vertically anything you're making before you commit to taking it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great idea. It, um, one thing I, um, I would just take a step back, step back five or six feet and look at it still horizontal. It does change your perspective when you're on, you know, when you're on top of it, it completely changes your look and you see things that you wouldn't see just taking, taking five, three steps back and looking at it, taking your time. But that's 
problem, right? When you look at it close, it looks good. You get it off and, you're, and you see these things. Okay. Yeah, good point. And Another is, thing I recently tried and it works is uh, I put black paper behind the piece. So when I'm viewing it, it stands out against the black because when I'm looking at it against the ways of my lathe or my vacuum setup or whatever's behind it, it's very distracting and my eye can't focus in on the curve. So I put a piece of black uh, foam core or something behind it and, and use that. So it's silhouetted against the black. And uh, for me, that really works. Excellent. Um, any other thoughts? Anybody have any questions or thoughts? Uh, so one thought, uh, Rich, and one uh, question, so, uh, or one tip. So if you're turning a bowl, um, instead, when you're looking at the, the inside of the bowl, run your finger from rim to rim, right the way across the bottom, because if there's any deviation, you will actually uh, feel it as you run right the way across the, the piece uh, that you may not see and you may not feel if you run from uh, center to, uh, to rim. Um, so question to the, to the panel here, uh, Julian was the only one that mentioned the base and not making it an afterthought. Um, what are the, what's the thinking here on when you turn a piece? Because if you sell them, the first thing people do is they turn them over and they look at the base. Um, so, um, from a design perspective, what do people do with the base and how do they think about it? I do give a lot of thought to the to the foot and to the base. And even as you said, Ed, when people turn it over, I think a lot of thought should be put into, you know, the signature, right? Like yeah. well, how does it look when you sign it? Do you date it? Do you put, you know, what kind of wood it is when you sign it? You know, is it very personal? Um, I think that is one thing that people really do like something to feel really personal. But then, then of course, the foot itself, um, you know, how high should it be? How wide should it be? That's part of the golden rule thing. but um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think it should be an afterthought. And I think that um, it's a really, really important part of the piece. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It is probably as important as shape and form. Well, just to comment on Ed's point about bases is Alan. Um, I, when I first started turning, the bases of my pieces had a remarkable uh, resemblance to whatever size chuck I had used. Um, what the tenon was. The, the tenon seemed to dominate what the base looked like, which is, you know, just doesn't make any sense at all. It has no relationship to the proportion. So, um, I, I, not that I always succeed, but now I try very hard when I'm making the tenon to have decided, is the tenon, is the base going to be included in the tenon? Um, or is the tenon going to be completely removed? You know, what size does it need to be um, to fit with the overall um, shape of, of it. Um, and do I want the base to, to be um, lifted a little bit so that it actually protrudes from the, the bottom of the, if it's the bowl from the, 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 ra the round and how does that relate to the curve? Um, or is it gonna go, the bottom of the bowl is essentially gonna sit right on a, on a table. Um, and you have to make that decision pretty early on um, because once you've shaped the whole sides of it, uh, you're, you're pretty much locked in to what that's, that's going to be. So it's hard to recover later on if you haven't planned for it. Hmm. Um, good. Anybody other, any other comments? Okay. So let me, let's wrap up this portion. Let me thank profoundly, profusely all those words, uh, Don, Julian, David, Joe, um, putting together those presentations. Uh, sharing, uh, you know, their thoughts, their experience, um, their heartache. Um, I guess we don't hear any heartache, but anyway, so uh, it was terrific and very interesting. And um, I guess my final question to the group is that, you know, how do we really keep this going, this whole continuous improvement? And I'd like everybody to kind of think about that. I don't know if we can answer that tonight, but um, it's something to think about. I, you know, Rich, I, I would say that I, I think, and I've, I've I'm at the point now where I do help people in terms of instruction. And I remember loving wood and hating to see so much of it on the ground, on the floor of the lathe. And I do think part of the problem, I think we'd all be better designers if we could work with uh, less expensive wood or it's easier to acquire. 
Um, and and so often, 90 or more percent is is not usable. It's on the ground. So, and I think when you're when you're doing it early, and you, you tend to make your pieces clunky for that reason. At least that's part one reason. And I think some of the best advice I've heard recently was from our very own Doug Waters. And yeah, he said that. that he said the way he looks at it very often, especially when he's working on a design, is that he looks at it as a practice piece. And uh, if you could, if you could do the practice pieces uh, out of wood, um, and 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 go ahead that way, you won't worry that much, and you could challenge yourself a little bit more, and maybe make that cut that's so much better than sanding away at sixty or eighty grit, or maybe never getting that curve that you know you want to get, or the bottom of that bowl that you know should be smaller and have a little nicer rounder curve so thanks so i think that's that. a great, great place to great place to to leave off let me thank the panel and uh, we're going to go to the, to the you guys were fantastic i think this is pretty interesting let's hear a round of applause for the panel thank you everybody um okay guys so i think that's that's pretty much it um i wanted to thank um everybody on the panel and everybody who was uh, bold enough and brave enough to share their uh, their their, their uh, good, bad, and ugly. Uh, I think it was a little bit interesting. And um, Ken, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Let's first make sure we thank Rich because Rich put this all together. He um, coerced our speakers to speak. <laughs> he worked with each of them to make sure that it had things to to present and that the logistics would work and the technology would work. So. Rich, uh, you were a hard driving taskmaster, and we were all very, very appreciative for a, a wonderful meeting. So let's yes. have a round of applause for Rich and everybody that was participating.